Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on the new NIST Special Publication 800-171. My name is Sean Sherman. I've been an IT and security consultant for the past 25 years and worked in and around the federal government for the past 15 years. I'm a security and compliance expert and have been involved in many federal and commercial entities. I'll be joined by my colleague Dave Henderson in a minute, but I'll get things rolling. Our agenda today is pretty straightforward. First, we will take a look at just what is this new document from NIST 800-171. Who does it affect and why should you care? Then we'll go on and talk a little bit more about the scope and requirements of the program as defined by the new, the new document. And then we'll talk about what steps you should take to comply with the new standard. Um, that'll be mostly what I'll talk about. And then finally, Dave will be covering how Tripwire uh, supports this new initiative and provide a short demonstration. So let's talk about what the NIST Special Publication 800-171 is all about. The intent of the initiative was to secure and protect sensitive government data on systems that the U.S. government does not run. So this would imply uh, suppliers, vendors, and partner IT systems that process data for the government as part of government agreements or programs or contracts. The, the people who are impacted by this new initiative are primarily the supplier and vendors who support the government because it's their systems that must meet this new standard. However, it also impacts the federal agency or organization who wants to get this information processed by an outside party because they're responsible for making certain that the information is correctly identified and it is very likely that they'll have some future responsibility for verification of that um, of the supplier meeting that mandate. The current method of enforcing this new standard is through the acquisitions process. In the federal government, this is called the FAR, the Federal Acquisitions Regulation, and in the Defense Department, it's DFARS, or the Defense Supplement to the FAR. These are the instruments that will be the initial place that contractors and procurement officers will see the language that points back to the NIST 800-171 as a new requirement. The contracting rules being formulated right now have not been fully baked. Clearly, although there is references to NIST 800-171 in DFARS uh, supplements, they have not made as much headway in the regular FAR, but we're expecting that this year. NIST 800-171 is part of a collection of documents that support FISMA, the federal law that mandates the implementation of security programs for federal entities. With the support of NIST guidance, this is how security programs are instructed on what controls they have to have in place to address risks and threats to data and systems. So I suspect that many listeners to today's webinar have probably heard about the NIST 800-171 and maybe even have downloaded it, taken a look at it. And the first thing that you notice is that Really, the whole regulation is about protecting 
something called CUI, or Controlled Unclassified Information. For those of us who've been around the government for a while, you probably remember a classification called SBU, which was called, uh, which stood for Sensitive but Unclassified Information. This was and is really the same information. Um, the CUI designation is a, is a relatively new designation that covers uh, all agencies and organizations with a consistent set of instructions. And uh, so the, the NIST document only really speaks to CUI. Now what CUI is, um, is somewhat controversial in that it, it, it must be marked and must be identified very carefully. This is sensitive information that is not public, but also is not classified. So we know about information which gets classified as secret or top secret and so forth. That information would not be covered under this, under this new regulation. This new document speaks to CUI, which has more to do with uh, information such as financial information uh, or legal information or research information that a federal organization gives to an outside party, a third party, uh, usually under contract or under some sort of an agreement to be processed or to be used in some fashion for the government's benefit. And that's the information that is under the protection realm of 171. The organization called NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration, is responsible for the rules around handling and marking of CUI information. And every organization that feels they might be impacted by 800-171 is well advised to go to the NARA site and look up information about CUI standards guidance, policy, and procedures. This is particularly true because the information may be um, given to an outside third party uh, from the government that is not correctly marked. And I suspect, as has been in the case in the past, um, that you know the responsibility will fall to the, uh, the vendor or the supplier to make certain that that information is correctly marked regardless. We've written down a few things on this slide to give you some examples of what CUI might be. Um, however, you know, it will, it will vary quite a bit depending on your specific organization, what data that they might be transferring to a uh, third party and for what purpose that would be. Here are some examples such as financial information related to transactions like processing financial aid uh, packages or um, doing outside financial um, diligence in some fashion. That would be CUI. Legal information uh, relating to uh, procedures um, or proceedings in a judicial or quasi-judicial um, organization. I've worked with uh, organizations that have their own courts and then they offload some of that, that processing to third parties. That would be CUI. Agricultural information, which is sensitive, not publicly um, uh, put out to the, to the public, uh, would be CUI. And then a huge volume of information will revolve around research information, which is unclassified typically, but which contains information which keeps it out of the public view um, due to confidentiality or other reasons, and um, this would be also CUI information. I've talked to a number of organizations who've asked, why is this NIST 800-171 referenced in acquisition rules or the FAR. This is because the government recognizes that there's a direct correlation between financial expenditures and reaching cybersecurity goals. 
obviously it's not always the best means to make sure that a complex technical solution is provided, but this is a starting point to what I suspect will be a more substantial program in the future. The provisions in the two uh, referenced acquisition rules in the FAR and the DFARS are the two most important regulations for federal buyers and contractors to pay attention to. While both the Civilian and Defense Acquisition Councils have been working on new rules, the DOD interim rule, the DFARS rule clause, gives contractors the most specific instructions of the two reference points here. And most importantly, the DFARS uh, clause stipulates that entities must comply with this new rule associated with NIST 800-171 by December of 2017. And that means that the clock is ticking and you have really just the next five or six months to make certain that your organization, if you do fall under the egress of the DFARS clause, must comply with NIST 800-171. So the next question, or maybe the question that's already been on your mind, is what does the NIST 800-171 require an organization to do? The document is broken down into a very similar format as other NIST documents with requirements laid out in that it's very uh, succinct and it's, it's very logically broken into different groups of controls that an entity must meet. There's a total of 110 controls in approximately 14 families um, that are listed in this, on this slide. So for instance, there are quite a few controls in the family called access controls. And you can see in this diagram that there's two columns with different number counts associated with that. Basic controls and derived controls, it really, for most, for, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't matter which category they're in. The truth is, is that you'd have a total of 22 controls that you have to meet uh, associated with access controls. That's uh, identification of users, how you add users, how you remove users, things like that, and how those controls are used to protect data. The NIST guidance also references uh, two other documents, uh, the FIPS Publication 200 and the NIST Special Publication 800-53, which are the basic uh, underpinnings of the FISMA law. And if you're already familiar with those documents because you're a federal agency or a, um, a third party, a vendor or supplier that, that already works in that world, then you already will be familiar with these controls. This is a subset of 800-53 controls. As you can imagine, NIST 800-171 presents quite a number of challenges to both the federal uh, contracting shop as well as to the vendors, suppliers, and partners to the government because of the stringency of the control framework and the attitude that the entity must protect that CUI data um, as soon as the end of this calendar year. We've put this slide together to talk a little bit about how you might want to approach your organization uh, being ahead of the game when it comes to 800-171 and in particular the December timeframe. The first point really is to make certain that 
if you're a vendor or a supplier, that you have a good working relationship with your federal procurement officer or contracting officer to have a chance to talk about this new rule. And in meeting the FAR rules or the DFARS rules, um, you know, what is what will be sufficient at the time that um, that December rolls around. Uh, and you will need to have a compliance program with 800-171. The truth is, of course, is that the NIST 800-171 is not complete enough yet to support a full compliance program. There's no auditing instructions. There's no um, guidelines yet on exactly how the federal government expects compliance to this standard. I would stand by also uh, with your contracting officer in looking for those audit and assessment guides to come out and make sure that you understand them when they do come out. The second point here is that um, IT and security professionals will, um, will tell you that Applying controls in a rational fashion takes quite a bit of time. Um, six months may be sufficient for a small system, but it might be impossible for a large and complex network um, or, or series of databases that might be used to support the government in processing CUI data. The best possible thing you can do at this point is to start planning, assessing your systems that might be holding CUI data, and also addressing staff and computer administrators um, to be sure that they're aware of what controls are required and what the compliance program is likely to require of them to prove at the time that this system goes into a compliance program mode. The last point here is to really stay um, stay tuned up on what 800-171 topics come into, um, into play. Um, I, I myself uh, track 800-171 news in Google searches and so forth, um, and I am looking for more audit guidance that I expect will be uh, forthcoming from NIST in the near term. Also, your federal contracting and procurement staff should start working with vendors to make sure that they understand um, what this new rule might have uh, to their existing contracts and make certain that this new rule does not disrupt existing work. So what are the recommended steps to go next? I'd say that the first point is really to do a little discovery. Identify if you do have CUI data, um, and that uh, could mean going into the NARA site to better acquaint yourself with what the markings are and how CUI data is identified, and then going back to your contracts and to your uh, contracting officers to determine uh, if they also think that data that's part of your contract is CUI data. Secondly, also determine which systems that you have that are processing CUI data will be in scope for this system. It could be that you want to reorganize your network or your system design to be more oriented around NIST 800 171 controls. It could be well warranted to logically isolate um, CUI data in order to lessen the impact of these security controls on all other networks and systems that you may have. The second point is to document and apply the controls in a manner which um, is not really described in 800-171, but which is described in the rest of the FISMA documents. Um, this means standing up a security plan and documenting the controls in, you know, by family in the manner that uh, is expected. You start by, of course, setting up 
uh, clarification on the scope and boundaries of systems that process the CUI data, and then documenting those compliance systems um, uh, in accordance with supplemental NIST guidance such as 800-37 or FIPS-199. There's a, a, a whole uh, alphabet soup of NIST documentation that supports uh, FISMA, but the key documents obviously are 800-53, 800-170, or sorry, 800-137, um, and you'll find many other references if you need them. The third point here, really, and and I'll give this over to Dave now, uh, is to is to look to Tripwire uh, to help uh, you with identifying the controls and making sure that your compliance uh, to those new standard controls. Um, can be made in a, in a simple and, and readily monitored fashion. In other words, that you can prove, auditably prove your, your status um, to these new standards. And then, you know, obviously prepare for your assessments. Um, this means that uh, uh, using tools like, like Tripwire can help uh, provide proof that you, you not only meet the control requirements, but that, that those controls are continuously monitored. Um, we're looking right now uh, for the release of a guide called 800-171A. This will be the audit guide, and this will help dictate um, future audits and assessments to this new standard. So now I think I'll give the uh, ball over to, to Dave, who will show you a little bit more about how Tripwire helps. Thank you, Sean. Hi, my name is David Henderson. I am the manager of Tripwire Systems Engineering for our federal team. I'd like to pick up here on a couple of slides prior to providing a demonstration of the Tripwire Enterprise and NIST 800-171 controls. If you take a look at this slide, you will notice that Tripwire Enterprise covers the vast majority of the policy requirements of 800-171. This includes the technical controls. That would mean all controls where the truth behind the control can be harvested as data from the endpoint being tested. As seen on this slide, Tripwire has mapped the NIST 800-171 requirement controls to its policy reference ID and then outlined how we meet the need to determine compliancy to the controls. At this time, I'd like to take about 10 minutes to show a demonstration of Tripwire Enterprise and NIST 800-171 in practice. Hi, today I'd like to show you how to use Tripwire Enterprise to perform NIST 800-171 compliance checking on your environment. What you're viewing on my screen is a Tripwire Enterprise dashboard. At the top of the screen, you'll notice I have trending graphs for NIST 800-171 scoring, as well as detailed test results for Linux and Windows. And in the center of the screen, I have graphs that reflect change that's occurring in my environment. On the bottom left-hand side of the screen, I have a widget that allows me to run scorecards for my various systems, as well as a widget over here that alerts me whenever a policy score threshold has crossed a specific boundary. And you'll notice here that I have two that have crossed boundaries. A boundary example would be something going from passing to failing or failing to passing. I'd like to focus on the graph at the top of the screen, the detailed, specifically the detailed test results. So let's take a look at my Windows systems. We'll work with Windows here. When I click on my Windows systems, you'll notice that the systems that were uh, tested are shown on the left-hand side of the screen. You'll also notice the number of pass tests, the number of failed tests, and my percentage compliant. If I wanted to drill down deeper, for instance, I want to look at the fact that my Windows 2012 system has 178 failed tests. Well, what are those failed tests? Click on the 178. This is going to give me a detailed report that shows all 178 failed tests. And what you're seeing here at the top of the screen is my ID for the test and the group it belongs to, etc. Very good information. And then you'll also notice here that the actual test that I'm looking for is built in an account administrator. Should be renamed. And um, so 
What this is doing is saying that the test verifies that the accounts, rename administrator account feature, is defined. Okay? If you're not, and if you're failing, then we're going to provide you with remediation guidance. Remediation guidance are step-by-step -step, um, set of uh, rules that need to be taken on the endpoint in order to be able to bring this test into a compliant state. And then you'll notice if we pass further down through this report that there is a reference for online information at technet.microsoft to get more data about this policy test, and then your actual result, date and time of the failure, and you'll see here that the new administrator name is still administrator. And then we move on down to the next test, and the next test, and this will continue through, through the report until you've gone through every failed test. What's nice about this is you can take this particular report and export it to PDF, and then take it to your change review board or review to determine which of these tests can be remediated, approved for remediation. And of course then you would take the steps as we show here in the remediation guidance and bring your system into a compliant state. And then of course at that point we would monitor that system continuously to allow you to make sure that it maintains that compliant state and alerts you if changes are occurring that take you out of that compliant state. So if I want less information, you'll notice there's some buttons at the top of the screen. One of them says Test Result View. Clicking on Test Result View converts my report into a spreadsheet format. And from here, I can look at the date and time of the test failed and the test that actually failed. I can scroll to the right in my report and see the element all the way over to the right that we harvested the data from to determine past fail. Okay, so let's take a look at something here. How about Windows fire, wire, Firewall Private Enable Firewall? If I click on the date and time, you'll notice that what we're looking at here is that the Enable Firewall equals 1 is what this test is looking for. If I click on my actual value, you'll see that there's no content. Fail. Okay, so it's not set. History. I failed this test twice, so I can look at either date and time to determine what the results were at that specific, specific date and time. Going back to the general tab, I'll take note down here that there's an element called HP Local Key Software Policies Microsoft Windows Firewall Private Profile Enable Firewall. That's the key that we harvested to determine pass fail, and it needs to be set to one. Close this. If I wanted to put a waiver on that and allow my firewall to be turned off, I will put the checkbox there, and I will click on New Waiver at the top of this specific report. And then I'll give it a name. Allow Firewall Disabled. Okay, and you know, normally that's not what you want to do, but this is just an example. So I'll come down here and select the test that we're dealing with, or the policy, which is NIST uh, 800 to Windows 2012. And then I've got the option to type a username in or select from the drop-down list a user that has the rights to grant the waiver and another user which has the rights to be responsible for the waiver. And those are role-based access control accounts that can be selected from the drop-down list. So we'll again put a description in for this particular waiver. And I notice I made a misspelling up there. Okay, so we're going to put something such as this in there. Allow firewall to be disabled for 90 days. Okay, and um, correct my typos. And so that's a waiver. You'll see that this is all set to 90 days at the bottom of the screen. I would then click Next. From here, I would add my nodes with failures. Okay, and then I would click Next again and then I would click finish and that waiver would then go in place and my scoring would artificially rise but with a waiver. Okay, So that's what this report is for. That is how you actually going to run compliance checks and determine whether or not uh, you have passes and fails, how to then remediate those pass and fail tests, and how to add waivers. Uh, another aspect of this is actually in the policy manager. You'll see there's several managers up here at the top of the screen. If I wanted to configure a specific policy for a specific set of nodes, I would actually go to the policy manager. 
This leaves the dashboard. From here, you'll see that there's a tree on the left-hand side of the screen that shows all the policies I have loaded. Notice I have the group NIST Special Publication 800 -171 highlighted, and on the right, the policies that apply to that specific group. So again, let's click on the Windows 2012. And when I click on that, I'm opening the actual properties of the specific policy set. You'll notice that there's a tab called Nodes. In here, I have all my Windows 2012 systems added. Actually, I have one system added. If I wanted to add more, I can click the Add button and select from a list of which systems I would like to have in this particular test. In this case, maybe it's all my Windows 2012 RT systems. So I click that group and then hit Add. Okay. The other thing that I might want to do is set my scoring threshold. You'll see this is set from passing to failing, but what if I wanted to add a new one? Maybe I'm compliant um, is 90%. So maybe I put something in here called compliant and, um, and I set it to a value of 90. And I give this color of blue. So basically now any score that comes in 0 to 89 is failing, 90 to 99 is compliant, 100 is full passing. So then I hit OK on this to put that into place. And if I wanted to run this policy test, I put a checkbox next to it and click Run from the button bar. The other way I could run this is to go into my Task Manager where I have a group of tasks for 800-171 and I could actually have a scheduled task execute and check for me on a periodic basis. And that concludes our demonstration and we will have a Q&A session coming up here shortly. Now that we have completed the demonstration, let's talk about next steps and takeaways. Now would be a good time to begin assessing your systems for CUI data and ensuring your staff and administrators are aware of the controls and compliance requirements. Federal contracting and procurement staff should start working with vendors to ensure that new rules are understood and that there is no disruption of contracts. Well, this concludes our webinar. I hope you enjoyed it, and we thank you for coming.